Move for approval. Aye. No citizens to be heard online. Move approval. Second. Turn my mic on. Very good. Thank you. Okay, approval of the minutes from February 28th. Move approval. Second. That approval by excuse, motion by Kevin, second by Dave. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're going to the annual department update uh, for Southern Water Conservation District. Uh, got Kevin Kassenberg representing them. Is that working? Sorry. Anyway, good good to see you all. Um, I was going to give you an update on uh, our Clay SWCD for 2022, and I see uh, with Commissioner Kravinoff here, I think I'll pass off to him being he was with us for 37 years, so take it away, Paul. <laughs> Anyway, just wanted to be, uh, give you a heads up on what we've been doing in the, in the past year. It's always kind of a, exciting to come here and show you what we've done, and I've got a little PowerPoint that I put together. Our Clay SWC staff, typically we have five, um, a staff of, of five. Right now we're, we're missing one um, with a retirement last fall. So we have uh, four of us that are presently on staff. Amanda Lewis is our district coordinator. She basically keeps the books and runs our urban conservation program. Gabe Foltz is our district technician and county feedlot officer. If you remember, Craig was our district technician and feedlot officer. This role has been taken over by Gabe, so now we're looking for a district technician and a uh, ag inspector uh, role that we're, we're hoping to fill here sometime soon. Anthony Nelson is our natural resources management technician. He does the most of the, the wetland um, pro pro problems and projects that come through our office also does our AIS coordinator for us and also does a lot of our just fill in the gaps where we need help with the tree planting and that type of thing and then myself and then like I say our district technician county ag inspector position is still open so we're hoping if you know somebody that um, is looking for a position I think we've got a good spot for them and a good staff to work with our tree program is primarily what we're probably known for um, we just unloaded a, a uh, two, over about almost 20,000 trees here, so we have Tony and Gabe taking a little break there. I'm sure Craig and I are still stacking stuff away, so that's just the way it works. Uh, we do provide site preparation, planting, and weed maintenance services. And in 2022, we sold a little over 16,000 trees to 160 customers. We planted for 23 customers and put on... 10 and a half, almost 10 and a half miles of fabric or matting over the, as a weed barrier for, over these trees. So if you haven't seen that in operation, you'll have to come and, and visit us sometime because it's, it's quite, uh, I'm not sure going to say fun, but it's, it's kind of interesting how it works. Our no-till drill program, we have two no-till drills that we offer to landowners. We've had this since 1993. Um, we've advanced uh, to providing it to over 35 landowners, which is something that's really taken off over the years. And we've been over uh, planted over 1,900 acres to landowners last uh, last summer and spring and summer and fall. And our motto still is, uh, "You call, and we'll haul it to you." The Rim Reserve Conservation Enhancement uh, Program, CREP, is as it's affectionately known, is a voluntary federal and state program. It's a perpetual easement that gets taken on uh, parcels of land. 
Um, recently, we had with the land sales going on this past year, the, how they have escalated. We worked with the county assessor, Nancy Gunderson, to assist us in producing some updated land prices on sales that have gone on. So the, in 2023 now, we have a, a updated um, land rate, I guess, that, that landowners can be uh, paid for enrolling parcels in, into the permanent easement. And in 2022, we finished up two easements, uh, completing a little over 300 acres. Presently, we have probably 80 easements that are, are since 1986 when the program started. So, and a little bit less than 4,000 acres have been enrolled. Wetland Conservation Act, this is Tony uh, Anthony Nelson's um, program that he works with. Last year, we worked with, he worked with uh, over 60 organizations and landowners to assist them with wetland concerns, whether it be filling, draining, um, I guess uh, anything to do with manipulating wetlands comes through our office, and also trying to avoid problems because there are some, some uh, legal violations that can occur. We've been working with the Red River Diversion Project uh, Authority, Ag uh, Drainage and Transportation Infrastructure are primarily the roles that impact wetlands in the county. The Ag BMP, Best Management Practices Low Interest uh, Loan Program, is handled through the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Through us, we send out uh, uh, newsletters trying to entice landowners to, if there's a project that maybe they could be a low interest loan that could be taken on. Septic system upgrades are one thing that qualifies. Conservation tillage is another one that has been very popular. With our no-till drill rental program that we've offered, we probably have over 30 landowners that have rented from us and have gone on to buy their own no-till drills. Also conservation tillage there, you can see the, the picture with the, the tillage operation. Keeping more residue on the surface is, is a huge um, re, uh, erosion reduction. So that's something that we aim to do rather than planting or plowing like uh, was very common years ago. Keeping more residue on the surface is something that we, we adhere to and try to really promote. And with the, with the equipment nowadays, equipment can handle a lot more residue on the surface. So like our no-till drills, they can take stand, standing stubble and do a good job of planting right directly into that. County feedlot offer position. Um, if you know, if you remember the last couple of years, we've been on probation with our MPCA partners. Um, we have uh, rectified that now. They uh, require us to go back and recheck all of our spot checks that were in 2021. And we did that last year. So instead of doing seven, we have to do 7% of the feedlots that are registered in the county. So in recent years, it's been seven that we've had to go do. So we redid the seven from the previous year. We did the seven that were, we were on the hook for in 2022. And we passed all the, um, the primarily it was the reporting system that we were having some concerns with that MPCA didn't like what we were doing. And uh, we've got that taken care of now, so we are back in good graces with them. So we're, we're happy to report that. County Ag Inspector Program, this is something that uh, has been Gabe's position in the past. We're hoping to fill that position with somebody. But in the meantime, all of us are kind of taking this role on as far as assisting landowners with uh, what are Minnesota's noxious weeds to be on the alert for. And there's a whole list of ones that need to be controlled by law. We also do um, landowners and co commercial applicators that want to come in and get licensed. We, t we do the examinations in our office. We did four, 45 of those last year. We also go through the process of training our township officials, which we will be doing next Monday during the county uh, association of township officers meeting. So there we'll be giving after the officers, after their meeting and the department heads give their presentations. We, we follow that up with uh, a presentation on a workshop on what's changed in the Minnesota noxious weed law for the coming year. And landowners, uh, there's a number of landowners that are assisting there that are also um, town board members that just need to be aware of what's going on in, the, in, the, in their respective townships. The buffer law, that was something that was passed in 2015. We were charged to basically put 50 feet average width of grass, some type of perennial vegetation along our, our wetlands and uh, streams and rivers, and also public ditches required a 16 and a half foot or rod width along their ditches. We are 99, we're happy to report 99% in compliance with the public waters and 99% in compliance with the public ditches. We have a couple of ditches that uh, 
the Buffalo Red River Watershed District is going through a, a hearing process to pay landowners for that land that is being taken out of production and also to, they're out um, staking, taking surveys and stuff like that. So we hope to have everything done. We hope to be at 100% with the public ditches. There's a couple of wetland issues that are, are out there that I think DNR still has to make a determination that we're waiting on. Urban conservation is something that's taken off in recent years since Mandy Lewis, our district coordinator, has taken the program on. She has uh, worked with River Keepers, the uh, city of Moorhead um, Community Ed Department, and we've hosted a number of workshops, uh, whether it be compost tumblers, or um, rain barrels, pollinator habitat workshops, and then also they did last year the first make and paint workshop. You can see one of the participants down there took a, a rain barrel and uh, or a garbage uh, compost tumbler and they did some painting for those things. We've also, um, this will be, last year was our fourth annual pollinator pint night that was held at Junkyard. Over 200 attendees were there and primarily they get to taste a special pollinator friendly beer, I guess we call it. Money honey is what the, what the uh, Junkyard has come to, uh, that they, they, they basically uh, make uh, cans that are available, also have it uh, at the tap and um, primarily it promotes our pollinator habitat. Uh, funds go, any money that we make on that goes to our, your, your Crestwood uh, site out there. Um, and also there was uh, little planting stations for, you could, you could uh, have plant your own little pollinator habitat and, and a little, lot of little kids and stuff were showing out there to, to assist with that. The Crestwood Pollinator Habitat, which is the county's land that we, your buyout portions, about eight acres, we held a, a, a pollinator site uh, uh, workshop out there where, land, where participants were looking at uh, identifying different native species. And Tony in our office is a very good one for identifying different uh, native plants. We also held, held a, a yearly cleanup out there. Um, in May, we had volunteers from Houston Engineering and our staff, and we removed a, a truckload of garbage. It's amazing how much garbage collects on that darn site out there. It, and year after year, it's just, it is just amazing. But um, it was, it was nice to have the, the county provide, uh, Justin provided a truck out there that we loaded stuff onto and was taken to the landfill. And then also we will be planting a, uh, a second phase we're calling with the tree planting. We'll be working with river keepers and some volunteers to do some planting along that area out there this coming year. Walk-in access, this is a program through the Department of Natural Resources where we uh, promote and try to get landowners to enroll property that will allow public hunting on it. Right now we have eight sites in the county with over 1,600 acres enrolled. And primarily what the landowners get, to, there's a, there is a cash payment depending on how many acres they put in and for how long, uh, long term. But uh, if they are not, or they're not um, opposed to having public hunting on their property, this qualifies and allows those that don't have access to their own property to hunt. It's a little hunting uh, area that it's in Clay County that um, can be used for Say for, there's, there's a number of pheasant sites and also some deer on some of these areas. So it's kind of a good little promotional item that we work with. The Aquatic Invasive Species Program uh, in 2012, that program was transferred to us through from the county. Uh, we do we, we have a little fishing derby with the FM walleyes. The um, River Keepers has a water festival in the fall. It's a seven day event. Over 2,400 fourth and fifth graders come through there that we have stations set up there. We also pay for some billboards that we have throughout the county, a couple of those if you've noticed them around. We also have some promotional items that <coughs> coasters, build bait bags, some can cozy, some other promotional items that we worked with. And Clay County doesn't have a whole lot of lakes in the county. We have four lakes that basically have a uh, public access. So us in comparison to Detroit Lakes, it's a much different county, but uh, or like I say, trying to get the word out to prevent the aquatic spread of aquatic invasive species is primarily education on our part. Each year we select a conserva outstanding conservationist from the county. Last year was La Rob and Lana Olson and their daughter Carrie. They are very, very top-notch farmers that we uh, and very uh, much um, cutting edge with some of the in in ingenious things that they've come up with. Carrie has been a, as, as a speaker for a number of our farmer panels that we've had. She, she is a good speaker and uh, a lot of fun to work with, all the whole family. But some of the items that they work with practices, no-till, water and sediment control basins, pollinator habitat. 
the MAWQCP, which is Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certification Program, the CREP program, and then Precision, Precision Agriculture. They uh, got to go along with us to our state annual conference in the, in the Twin Cities back in December, where they were given a, a award at, at that time also. One Water, one, sh one Plans. This is something that has really come to the forefront in recent years. We have two different um, practices shown here. One is a towwood sod, basically the erosion around the riverbanks there. The, um, the DNR is, uh, is a big proponent of using bi bioengineering um, um, material. So instead of allowing rock and that type of thing in the river anymore, it's, that's a tough sell. They uh, are looking at more using vegetative, so trees, um, branches, uh, basically sod. It is basically kind of a natural uh, material to reinforce the banks there. The one on the right there, we had a, a landowner that was uh, his, his house was being impacted, something called a J-hook, and it's the first one that we put in in the county. The DNR, who we used to approve and permit, things we used to call stream barbs, that would be little rock, um, little, little dams that would jut out in the stream. They don't like those anymore. There's too much rock apparently in those. So they want these J-hook design, and it requires a five to six foot diameter rocks to be placed in, and you can kind of see them strategically. There's two, two, of, them on, two of them on this uh, photo there, but they jut out into the stream, and basically they prevent the current from hitting, the, the river current from hitting the stream uh, bank, and forcing that current to the outer, or to the inner bank uh, is, is the idea behind them. But, with those size rocks, it increases the, the cost of the project immensely. So those are things that we're, we're fighting with, uh, I shouldn't say fighting, but we're trying to get um, the old stream bar projects that we used to get uh, permitted to allow those. Like I say, it just gets to the point where these get so expensive that it's, uh, it's, it's cost prohibited. Other one watershed, one plan uh, practices, cover crops, keeping your soil armored over the uh, growing season and also after the season. So things like uh, you know, perennial rye is one that's been a good one for planting in those areas. Also on the bottom picture there, the water and sediment control basins. You can see the left picture is a gully or near Holly that was uh, causing problems for the landowner. He could not cross that area with his, with his uh, equipment. So a water and sediment control basin basically comes in and puts a tile line that follows along that gully down to a safe outlet. It is then filled, that gully is filled in, and then you can see in the right bottom right there is, you can see the tile line being installed. And then the one on the, the further right there, you can see it's hard to, sh hard to see, hard to get a good picture of these things, but there's actually a dam that is put up across that, that old gully. It's sloped so the farmer can actually farm those. Uh, it's back sloped so, it's, so it can be farmed. And there, it basically retains about 40, up to a 40 acre watershed behind that dike. And then is safely drained out through a tile line. So like I say, it's something that it'll be, it'll be cropped and you won't even know the difference. But those have really caught on in, in recent years. We've got 11 of those sites that we've got that, that were installed in the past year. So uh, Becker County has been very active in those and it's, it seems to be catching on in Clay County. A couple other sites that we have worked on it with one watershed one plans. Um, you can see there's a gully from on the left hand side there from uh, is up near the Buffalo River. We shaped that up, put a big pipe in there and it has been seeded down to grass in that uh, swale area. Also on the, the bottom photos there you can see a, a farmer's field where it was basically allowed to drain directly into our ditches. Um, sediment filling in the ditches requires to go back in there and clean those out, whether it be a, a back, a back uh, hole or scraper of some kind to go in there. And a, a kind of a simple fix in there is to put a pipe in there and then put a top over the, over the, over the pipe and it meters out the water so it, it uh, like I say, the sediment is, is dropped out behind the, the pipe on the field side so it doesn't get into your ditches. And like I say, those are getting to be things that I think we have numerous places that we can use those in the, in the county. So between the, the two watersheds, that's the Buffalo Red River Watershed District and the, and the Wild Rice Marsh Watershed District, uh, in, in the last couple of years, we put in over 300, almost $350,000 worth of projects of cost share dollars to landowners um, from our one watershed, one plan fund, about a quarter of a million. And in that, we can partner with the NRCS's uh, EQIP program to get landowners up to 90% cost sharing for, for putting the erosion uh, pra practices. Uh, and they've come up with about $100,000 for, for their, their part in the program. 
And uh, last fall, we had, on September 8th, we had our fall tour. We try to do this about every two years. COVID has had some impacts on that in the last couple of years. But last year we did, uh, we, we went and saw a number of these sites that we just saw on the previous slides, as, as well as a demonstration on that matting installation. And uh, let's see, at the time we had, we'd invited our, our legislators, um, four that were presently running for our state office, showed up and two that were successful, both uh, Senator Rob Kupik and Representative Jim Joy were in attendance. And then last December 8th, we uh, had a legislative briefing. The SWCDs in the state are really trying to get in the governor's or the state's general fund. And Paul, I know, can talk a, a lot about the SWCD aid. Um, last fall, we had a presentation that we made to our legislators Rob Kupek was there, Jim Joy was there, um, Senator Eakin, Marquardt, and, and Frank was in attendance. And uh, basically our focus was to let them know what SWCD aid is, and we're hoping for their support. And then on the bottom right, uh, there, uh, then MASWC President Paul Krabenhoff was presenting to Paul Marquardt the MASWCD Legislator of the Year Award. So it was kind of a... Nice event, I guess, and last week we met with our legislators, um, Senators Kupek and uh, Mark Johnson, as well as Representative uh, Heather, Heather Keeler, Deb Keel, and Jim Joy, basically kind of trying to get uh, them in support of our, of our uh, SWCD aid for this year. So, so we'll see where that goes. Thank you. Questions? I was just going to comment on the last slide you hit up there. That was one of the best presentations. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. Give it that time. So anybody that missed out on that, missed out on the presentation. I mean, you gave a good one again today. Thank you. And um, it was just a good um, good program you had. Thanks, Frank. Like I say, it was really fun last, last week with the legislators, and, and especially Representative Joy and Senator Kupek. They definitely were all on our, gosh, they were along on our tour. And I, that uh, there's a few things that made impressions on them, so that was all. It was all well worth our time. But um, it, was, it was good to get to meet them all, and fun to get to meet Senator Mark Johnson and Representative Keel. They just moved into our area here, three townships wide. So I think them getting to know who we are a little bit is only beneficial to us too. So, Kevin, yeah. hey, Kevin, I, I just want to. Um if you could give thank you to your crew there that's been working on the, the problems that we had with the feedlot issues. Uh, it sounds like that's well on its way to getting back to normal. Uh, even though uh, I'm not so sure that from our standpoint there was ever anything wrong. We didn't think so either. Right, yes. right. And I, and I raised that issue and I, I think it became more of a technical, technicality on how you read reports. Uh, but anyway, it sounds like that's back to doing well, and whoever's been working on that, and I'll give them a big thank you from us. So. We'll do so. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'll make a final comment. Uh, just going back to the SWCD aid, um, just to let you know that um, certainly uh, the uh, Association of Minnesota County is strongly support what you're doing, and, and uh, for the rest on the commission here, uh, it's a matter of having funding in place that will be part uh, run through the Department of Revenue as aid rather than every year waiting in the omnibus bill for legislators to give some water districts uh, their state allocation. So the whole point of it is, and we've been working on it for years, in my last four years with the right. some water, I worked uh, a lot uh, working with legislators and uh, state agencies uh, trying to see the need for this so that when it comes to the hiring uh, of people to uh, do these projects that, that we just have, we call it stable funding, yep. and that's reliable so that um, as we have employees, they know that there's money going to be in place for longevity of their jobs. And um, also we've seen greatly through the one watershed, well, the Legacy Act that was put into place constitutionally in 2008, uh, all that money that now goes in the Clean Water Fund, 
uh, you know, we're doing, well, your numbers grow every year, uh, the amount of projects that we put in, uh, whether it's just through the local SWCD on its own through grants or non-competitive grants through, uh, um, you know, our uh, Buffalo Red, or watershed districts and through counties. No. Uh, just uh, know you're um, supported that I, I think it will pass. I, I'm very optimistic. It just matter what amount, right? But at least yes. the amount that they're talking about right now is what we have. But uh, uh, certainly, I think SWCDs would like to see that grow. So I hope you're successful. I, I knew I should let you run with this thing. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so. Any other comments? If not, thank you so much for running the great department there, yeah. Kevin. Very welcome. Thank you very much. And now for our star candidate for the county, <laughs> our veteran service officer. I see the meeting room's all full for me. <laughs> and then everybody took the day off. <laughs> Hey, do I just hit the arrow? Yeah. All right. You can see I don't do much of this anymore. <laughs> Morning, Chair, Commissioners, Kurt uh, Cannon, Clay, uh, Veteran Service Officer for Clay County. Uh, just a little bit about our office. Uh, we uh, specialize in the counseling, advising, and assisting veterans, widows, and dependents with claims, uh, federal, state, and county agencies. Uh, just to secure uh, them any benefits would they may be reasonably entitled to under laws and statutes. So, um, we serve as a liaison between federal, state, and county VA benefits and programs. We advocate uh, and are nationally accredited, me and Jennifer are. We advise you and your dependents of your rights and entitlements under various federal and state laws. Uh, actively uh, changing all the time. Uh, we assist uh, filling out forms and papers and obtaining documents and affidavits. We work in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Veteran Affairs, VA Claims Office, VA Medical Centers, National Service Organizations, and other public and private agencies. Just uh, highlights of, uh, general highlights of uh, what we do in our office, uh, not, uh, not everything that we do, but uh, we start out with pensions for veterans. Uh, we educate in training. We provide home loan guar guarantees, and that's just the application for the home loan. We send that to St. Paul. Uh, we apply for life insurances for them. Most of these are just uh, applications that we assist filling out for them and sending them to the proper agency. Uh, we provide burial and memorial benefits with awards and medals, health care, and uh, disability compensation is probably 80% of our time. And uh, just to expand on that, that's a uh, service connection for a disability that uh, occurred while in service or they think it occurred while in service. And uh, if they become granted service connection, it can range from a 0% to 100% uh, with compensation, uh, with monetary compensation back to the veterans starting at 10%. And I believe that's 160 a month, all the way up to 3,600 a month at 100% disabled with the VA. So uh, they do get compensated uh, for a certain percentage of their time. And I, I say that for later on, and you'll understand uh, some of the percentages. So, um, 2022, we had an admin assistant, Bonnie. She went full time, so that puts us to three FTEs in our office. We did attend finally face to face national training in San Antonio to get our national accreditation CEUs. Uh, we continue and have been participants in the Clay County Veterans Court and local, uh, the local Beyond the Yellow Ribbon organization. We just had one graduate right now in Veterans Court last week, so we, are, we don't have any participants now, but uh, we, I'm sure we will. 
Uh, on top of all our current stuff, Blue Water Navy claims, original stuff, they added the PACT Act. Uh, this expands and extends eligibility for VA health care for veterans with toxic exposure for veterans for Vietnam, Gulf War, and post-9-11 errors. So basically they added a couple presumptives, meaning that it's uh, conceded by the VA for Vietnam vets, and then uh, we added Gulf War presumptives, uh, mostly breathing issues for burn pits, toxic exposure. So uh, now they can, uh, now we can, so when they add something like that, then vets come and we claim those on top of the other claims. Presumptives are pretty easy. You just have to have the diagnosis and the time at Southwest Asia or Vietnam. So, so we put all that together and claim. Uh, then 9-11 uh, bonus came out in 2022. Legislature passed and Governor Walt signed the first ever uh, veterans bill that included funding for a service bonus payable to eligible veterans who served after 9-11-01. The 600 is a veteran that uh, the requirements was entered active duty as a resident of Minnesota and currently live in Minnesota. Those are the two requirements to get the money. If you didn't have the medals, like you uh, had a service medal, meaning you supported Iraq or Afghanistan or Southwest Asia, but wasn't actually boots on ground, you got the 600. And then if you had the medals that supported your time in service and boots on ground, you got the 12. And then the family member could get a $2,000 one if they were killed in action. We also, along with Social Security, uh, received the uh, largest increase in 30 years, the 8.7% increase in our monthly compensation payments. So that was nice uh, bump for our veterans. A little background, so uh, little st uh, little numbers. I suppose the, uh, the uh, to measure success, I guess we have some numbers for you. Thirty-five, three thousand five hundred forty-nine veterans in Clay County. Uh, the state soldiers assistance program, which includes uh, a vet coming in to us, and either they need dental grant, a home repair grant, shelter, optical, auto medical, utilities, or education grants. We, we apply for those for them. Little comparison, Anoka County has 19,764 vets. They did 22,529 awarded to them. We have five times less, four times less, 3549, we did 45,000 awarded. So we doubled Anoka. Uh, which is actually putting it out, asking the questions, visiting with the vet, determining what they need, and then uh, utilizing our resources that we know are available and getting what they need. So, 381 claims in 2022 for 1,431,000. Uh, retroactive payments for our vets, meaning that we, uh, they took long, um, they took a long time to get. Uh, they were backdated to a certain period of time. Uh, and they received a lump sum payment uh, that uh, was $979,133 for vets. Property tax exemption, this is where it comes a percentage. Uh, you can only get this property tax exemption in Clay County or in Minnesota being 70% or higher. So 70% 70, 70 disabled is a difficult task in itself, but uh, you can get it all the way after 70%. And at 70% to 100%, you get $150,000 exempt off your market value of your house in, in Clay County. And 100% permanent total, which is your total disabled, you can get $300,000 off your market value. So it's a big deal, big benefit, cuts their house payment down or their escrow. The city parcels in 16, I go from 16 because I started at the end of 15. Uh, the city parcels with 124 exemptions to 254 exemptions in 2022. So we uh, doubled that, which is extremely hard to do. So county parcels were 76 and 16 to 162 this year, this last year. So um, hopefully they don't let go of the program because all their vets are exempt from property tax. But. It's nice to have that benefit. 
veteran contacts per office visits, phone calls, emails, communications might be a little light because Kurt doesn't chart very well. But uh, I like to talk a lot, but forget to chart. But uh, 4,901 contacts in 2022. Uh, and knowing that each of these contacts require research and work, uh, they, they go in the, the saying in our office, uh, does, does he have a couple minutes? You know, it turns out to a couple hours. So it's, uh, but each one requires hour, two hour, three, four hour work. So a lot of contacts with these vets. It averages about 16 to 20 contacts a day for us, and uh, which is extremely busy. So um, that's all I have. The vets in Clay County have hopefully been taken care of and we have resources and, and everything at our fingertips and available to our vets. So we try to uh, listen and determine what they need and uh, service them the best way we can. So that's our goal for every vet. I appreciate your guys' support, most definitely. Well, it looks like you contact quite a few people here. Anybody any comments or questions? <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, the disability could could increase with aging. You know, we first get that. Uh, let's just go with hearing. Uh, very, very uh, kind of easy claim, but not, not too easy because you have to have audiograms in service. But you get a 0% when they're you know, 50 years old, and we look at some of them are now 60, 70% because they're in their 70s and hearing does de deteriorate. So you can be non-property tax and go into a property tax because of aging. So they do increase over time. And your bones, your knees, your joints, they're going to get worse too. Mm -hmm. So, But we do have to put it in for increases. You don't get those automatically. So the vet has to return to us saying, hey, my hearing's worse, so then we'll put them in for an increase. The VA won't just come and increase you. So. And then the property tax, you have to be aware because that's also an application with our county and city, and with myself too. So uh, there are vets, unfortunately, that probably don't have that benefit because it, they weren't followed through with. But we follow through with every award that we get to make sure they get their benefits associated with that percentage. Uh, migration, yes, yes, uh, being so close to North Dakota. Um, uh, there is a 30-day residential rule <coughs> benefits for state benefits. You have to reside in Minnesota, so that kind of helps us. Uh, are we going to help a vet that comes over from North Dakota? Absolutely. You know, we want to, we'll help them from Becker and Wilkin and anybody, you know, it's just their situation, so. At the end of the day, we're here eight, eight and a half hours. I might as well serve who comes through the door. So uh, a lot of migration and, and a lot of going back the other way, too, you know. So uh, and a lot of county jumping, and you have to try to get them back to their county. And, and uh, But then they move, or there's just certain situations. Where, but there's a lot of float, floating. Around. Thank you for that. I just think it's a valuable yes. uh, program. Yep. Great asset, great resources. Minnesota supports their vets tremendously. If you live in Minnesota and you haven't utilized or, I mean, we pride ourselves, Clay County, on zero homeless, too. But I, I do say identified homeless folks, you know, because they have to be identified before we can act. But, uh, you know, so... Lake County has Beyond the Yellow Ribbon, the American Legion, the VFW, and our office. So if you see a vet, send them our way. So. Well, thank but, you very much. For plus, we have a little fun you. in our office. So. Yeah. <laughs> Check out our website. <laughs>
I appreciate your guys' support, though. It means a lot. No, you do a great job. We can go forward. Yes. Thank you. All right. Keep up the good work. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, now a little bit past nine o'clock, but uh, we got our bid opening uh, for a project uh, for County Kasag 18. Yeah, good morning. So this is a bid opening for the Mill and Overlay and Cold in Place recycling job on Kasai 18. It does run from 80th Street to Trunk Highway 9, six miles. Um, we did receive five bidders. All of them are complete bids with a bid amount in the, in the amount of 5%. The first bidder we did receive is Central Specialties out of Alexandria. Their bid is $3,348,602.56. Six the second bid we received was Knife River Materials. Their bid is $3,277,115.21. $3,277,115.21. The third bid we received was Border States Paving. Their bid was 3245000 $962.15, $3,245,962.15. The fourth bid was Mark Sand and Gravel. Their bid was $3,149,609.15. $3,149,609.46. And the last bid we received was RJ Zavril and Sons. Their bid was $2,963,831.80. Okay. <laughs> but I do feel that we did receive five very good bids on this project, and I, I would recommend approval contingent upon state aid approval because there is LRIP funding on this project. We received an $800,000 grant. And this did come in. I don't know if you saw the sheets in your packet for um, tab, tabbing. It did come in a little bit underestimate. This is the first time I saw them come in so close, all from the top to the bottom, <laughs> that they've been that close to each other. It's just um, it's crazy how sometimes they can be that close. We've had some bids be within a hundred dollars on a couple million dollars before. And these are pretty close for a pretty proud. Yes, Kevin. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Um, are you? Is there any concern about past performance on? No, so last summer RJ Zavril did both CASA 12 and CASA 52. Both projects were done well ahead of schedule and I thought turned out really, really well. There was a project prior to that that there had been some question on, that's why I read Yep. No, I thought last summer they did an awesome job and two projects that turned out really, really well. Mr. Chair, I would move the little bit of our, our RJ Zavril and Sons uh, subject to um, Review. Second. Yeah, we got a motion by Kevin, second by Dave, to approve R.J. Several and Sons for the <coughs> for the project. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Yeah, and the second item I have is approval to advertise for our yearly supply bids. So our yearly supply bids include gravel, bituminous, culverts, and construction equipment. So the bids will be, the proposed letting date will be April 20th at the highway department. We open those at the highway department, so we have five days before to tabulate everything and bring a packet for board approval on the 25th. Okay. Make a motion to uh, approve the uh, advertising of the early supply bids. Second. 
We've got a motion proposed, second by Kevin, to approve the advertising for the yearly supply bits. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Up there. And Joe, now for your update for facilities maintenance. All right. Good morning, Mr. Chair, board members. Um, yes, I'm giving my yearly update here. I tried not to get into the weeds here and touch on all the highlights for you. So um, just first off, our mission is to operate, maintain, and preserve the physical asset of Clay County facilities. We provide quality service in an efficient, professional manner in order to create a, and maintain a clean, safe, and comfortable environment for all staff, clients, and citizens here at Clay County. So. We do our best. Uh, currently, right now, with our staff, we have one operation supervisor, one administrative assistant, um, uh, maintenance technicians. We have seven full timers and one variable hour. Uh, custodians, we have seven full time, two permanent part time, and 12 variable hour. Uh, we have one custodian lead and one facilities director. Currently, here are all our facilities that we we operate here or, or have a hand in doing um, law enforcement center, correction facility, uh, courthouse, family service center, juvenile center, power plant, resource recovery, government center, rental house, northwest lot up there, um, DMV lease space, we do some cleaning out there, cold storage building highway, we just put that up last summer, um, landfill, joint highway facility, and all the shops in Barnesville, Glendon, Felton, Ulan. Comstock and Georgetown for the highway uh, and the storage facility that we just purchased and uh, a couple years ago now, but and then uh, the future substance abuse center we are currently working on. So. Here is just a little snapshot. I know some of you have seen this before, but wanted to wanted to show you how we've been busy since 2018. So as you can see, we opened the jail in the summer. Um, jail and the LAC uh, entered into a master plan study in 2019 we we had some uh, uh, some issues or some space issues with the courts so we started talking about that COVID hit and then we ended up changing things and juvenile center expansion was done in the spring of 2020 um, we relocated the DMV into the fall of 2020 over into the mall completed the boardroom in uh, winter of 2020 and um, purchased a government center in spring of 2021. And that summer we purchased the storage building, ended up um, selling the old DMV lot to the city. And uh, there was some storage up there, so that's why we bought that. And um, completed the new courtroom six across the hall in the fall of 2022, which they are now using. And um, wrapped up on the resource recovery center in winter just a couple weeks ago, or a few weeks ago. So. Uh, construction begins on the new substance use crisis center uh, this spring and we're starting to talk about the DMV future planning so just wanted to throw that timeline out there for a visual and a snapshot I guess so uh, just a quick update on the family service center um, as you know it's an enterprise fund right now we uh, you bring in we bring in a estimated revenue yearly of 1.2 million just over 1.2 million and through rent. Uh, we do that by charging everybody on the first floor tenants 1375 a square foot and we uh, second through fifth is 1275 a square foot. So right now we are 60% of the building is occupied by Clay County departments and 40% is occupied by nonprofit agencies. Right, right now the building is 100% occupied and we continue to take a lot of calls about people wanting space. So I'm, it's a, uh, it's, not a problem to fill that building. So wrapped up on a fourth floor project update this past year, we moved child support up to the fourth floor and um, opened up some space on the first floor to allow dental to do an expansion project there. Uh, currently right now their bids are opening at the end of the month and we hope to start in the spring here for them. So um, lobby improvement project, we updated from floor to ceiling all the way from first floor up to the fifth floor, the main lobbies, and uh, those are all complete. So 
Got a five to 10 year financial plan as my goal this year is to meet with the building finance committee to just take a deeper look into the building. There's not huge concerns, but it's not a money maker either. And um, just one of my goals is to, is to meet and just take a look at that, at that um, the next 10 years. So usually we get one major issue of an MCIT claim. We did get one this last June. We had a, a, a sprinkler, a, what would you call it? A, a rain leader under the ground broke and flooded the first floor, a little piece of the first floor there, but working with MCIT on that. And then uh, county department space needs, we continue to have some of that. We're gonna be, we're vetting through that with the building committee as we speak. And then just a budget note, natural gas increase has been pretty rough on, on that facility and all facilities actually, but we did increase that line last year to account for some of that, so. Okay, uh, just a update on the fleet management. Um, as you remember, about a year ago, we ended up um, entering into a contract with, with Enterprise, ordered uh, to lease all vehicles. We just actually received that now. So um, wanted to give you guys a real time of our numbers here. They had a five year plan on how to save you know, X amount of dollars, but this is kind of the real plan I wanted to show you. On the left, you're gonna see all the old vehicles that we currently have now. Now that they're all showed up, we're starting, we're gonna start selling these off. And so this is just kind of how this has worked out. We have a proposed, you know, the old vehicles that we now have are gonna be sold. We have estimated of just over 111,000. And um, these are numbers that are given through Enterprise, um, what, the, what the cars are worth. And um, so we're gonna estimate that much and that'll go into fund 50. To, and that is the, the, the fund that helps uh, sustain this. That's the fund that, that does this fleet. So, um, and then as you can see on the right side, uh, we have an annual lease payment of around 7,100, or not an annual, monthly, and then the annual is 86,000. And we pay for this by every time somebody rents a vehicle, whether it's uh, social services or somebody, they pay uh, 35 cents a mile and then that goes into fund 52 um, talking with Lori, we do have a um, she is proposing that we up that this year during the budget to a 50 per, a 50 cents she it has been many years so she's feeling that's appropriate so um but yeah that's what that is another thing to note here too is when we first signed this agreement a year ago we had a um, proposed of nine traverses as we did a study on this over the year COVID never bounced back Really, we felt we didn't, the, the use of the cars went down and it has never bounced back. So we actually defleeted three traverses and have not had a problem at all. So um, that was kind of one thing we wanted to, we wanted to lean out this program, not have the ability for somebody to get a car whenever they want, but not have too many cars sitting here that are brand new. So, yeah, Mr. Campbell. Yeah, Joe, thank you. Um, so when we went, before we had gone to the leasing all of these vehicles yep. uh, we would do the purchase of the vehicles and we would have the annual amount that would be put into the internal service account yep uh, so in comparison to you know so that, so we can kind of keep a gauge on yep on is leasing working for us from a fiscal responsibility standpoint yep is there a way that we can go back and and look at what our annual payments were to our our internal service fund on an annual basis and compare that to the far right column here yes yes and i know one of enterprise one of enterprises um pitches to us too was every year they would they would uh help with uh, they they supposedly this five-year savings they're going to do they they have a way of of telling us every year how we're hitting our mark but yes but well, we can do that too well, I think one of the easiest yeah. ways to hit our mark is to see how see it, how much cash went out this year versus how much we were doing before. Yeah, it, yeah, it is definitely easy to just yeah. do that exactly. So, um, and then like you say, defleeting was a thing because I thought we were heavy that way, you know. Too. So that, that 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 makes sense. That three traverses was quite a bit of money, so I felt that was good. But um, one thing to note too is is for some of you that weren't involved in this. Um, the when we make that lease payment we get the equity back so it's not your conventional lease it's it's uh, other than a small uh, fee from enterprise we we get it back so in in two to three years when we get these vehicles up at that 60 70 thousand mark 
the goal is to, they say the goal is to sell it at that time and recapture that high value resale and then roll that back into our fund 50. So if we own these, if we make payments past four years, we actually own the vehicle and that's not what we want to do because apparently that's your threshold of losing money when you make too many payments past four years. So uh, I'm still trying to understand this a little bit better, but yeah, so we do get that equity back every time we make a payment too. So um, yeah, so I'm hoping, hoping uh, I, I actually want this to be a yearly update in my budget as well, just as a presentation. And then, so. and then one final question on, yep. on this subject. So the, the, um, the amount that each of these vehicles um, under our prior process, again, we had the internal service fund and they, and that each of those line items would build a value. Right. That was actually a cash value that we'd have in reserves. Yes. Yes. Uh, is, are there any of those, you'll have to talk to Lori about yeah. this, but are any of those reserve dollars left? Uh, and could, if so, because they're, we're under this lease system where there's no, there's no need to carry a, and right. a balance, it, right. Cause it should. So, so out. is there a way that we could shift that to another need? If right. I, I'm not sure that there's anything left yeah. or not. But. Yep. I'll check with Lori. I know, um, prior to this, we were actually leasing like six vehicles too. So we had kind of a split weird thing going on there, but, um, I'll, I'll dive into that and okay. check in to see what that is. So, and have an update for you on that. So thank you, Joe. Yep. So that's the fleet uh, management update there. Just a minute, Joe. Yeah, go ahead. Just real quick, if I can follow up. Um, so it's a whole new fleet, it looks like. Yes. 2023s, right? Yes. Do you, do you um, run a rotation then, or is it all, I mean, or is it a mileage thing? Or yeah, yeah. So all these fleets that you see here get checked out um, by request, the employee will, will request it. So yes, and if what we do too is we'll watch if one car gets used too much, we'll we'll, we'll schedule another one to get the miles because we want to use them all kind of, you know, so yeah. Yep. And it kind of goes to uh, uh, Kevin's, it's the cash flow issue, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sure that um, it's all holding in line. It, it doesn't stack up one year. Right? Yes, exactly. And we, yeah, and we, we just feel that, um, like you say, we did feel like we were a little heavy on our on our fleet, just because we can actually see that by how much is scheduled on a daily amount and how much miles are put on cars. So, so, so yeah, uh, we did, one of the benefits, we've, we received a lot of concerns um, with the old fleet that we had vans and we had cars. Those are kind of the two big mixtures. And so we went to a trailblazer, which is a lot safer. So we've gotten a lot of compliments on both the Traverse and the trailblazer, so. So, um, and with the Traverse, um, reason why we went with that is it, it does have a better resale value in three years too. So it's a little bit more than a van, but we're gonna hopefully sell more and recapture a higher value on that. And so uh, my first year doing this, so I'm hoping to okay. iron out the wrinkles. <laughs> so. All right, Dave. Yeah, just, I noticed, why is that one Trailblazer $100 more uh, per month than the others? Uh, you found an error. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yes, yeah, so good catch. So, yeah, that's not right. So they're all, they're all uh, 550. Okay. There, so good catch. So <laughs> I'll make sure I change that. So, but yeah, these are all of them. Of course, we know the sheriffs have went with, with this fleet program too as well. The goal was to have, tw I couldn't lease without, I couldn't, I have to have 20 cars or they won't lease to me. So um, the sheriff on board now has helped me a little bit on that, but um, I, with the flexibility, I can defleet a little bit now that we're working with that fleet as well. So, so any more questions on the fleet? Yeah. All right, just, this, just a quick update, capital improvements. Um, we took out a bond of 3.3 million. Uh, just over 3.3 million. Uh, we were granted uh, ARPA funds of just over 1.2 million uh, with a total of, we did 32 projects. Uh, I would say in this past year, a lot of that happened within the last two years for sure. Uh, projects left that we have, just an update, Ulan shop. We are, we're, we're starting in April there. That building came late. So we'll have that done by the summer. Um, salt sand tent, joint project through MnDOT um, that is supposed to happen in the spring here as well. 
uh, cold storage is built and complete other than a little bit of concrete work inside there that has to be done in the spring. Uh, power plant generator is in Barnesville right now, which is good news. So that is supposed to happen here sometime in the spring too. And then Comstock and Georgetown, we just have a, a couple driveways to do in front there. And that's, yeah, so hopefully we'll wrap everything up this spring and be done with uh, the capital improvement plan there, so. Yeah. All right, and just a huge thank you to our custodian, custodian staff. They show up daily and it's every night they come, they get the place cleaned up. So Jenilyn Roethlisberger is our, custod our custodian lead. We created that position a couple of years ago. Um, to support Brian Friedrich, our operations guy, and she provides a lot of the, the supervision at night with our custodians, and she just is amazing. So I wanted to thank her. And of course, Brian and the maintenance crew, and Betty, my assistant, she's gone this week, so I'm feeling, I'm feeling it big time. And just, uh, just to thank you, the building committee, they guide me in all these projects that we've done, and I appreciate them. And the county board has approved uh, a position in 2023 for a new maintenance maintenance guy and then a um, couple of variable hours were turned into full timers for custodians. So we've seen that major positive impact. So I, we appreciate it and it doesn't go unnoticed. So <clears throat> with that, I yield for any questions, any more questions. Are you full staff now? Yes. Yep. Full staff. Yep. Everybody maintenance and custodian. So good. Yeah. Yep. Kevin, Joel, any surprises with our new resource recovery facility? No, nothing. A couple garage door little, little quirks, but we've got that fixed, but uh, nothing yet. So, the yeah, most recent uh, winter storms we've had, uh, still yeah. been an issue out there at all? Nothing. A little bit of the scale uh, build up under the scale, but Corey and I are planning, working a, a way to handle that. So, uh, other than that, no, nothing. City of Moorhead's been clearing the snow and it's been going well so far. So, Thank you. Good yep. to hear. Very good. Any, any other questions? If not. Thank you very much, Joe. Okay. Thank you, Bart. Okay. Joe, I, Joe, I'd imagine you're gonna your snow removal budget is uh, getting close to probably being. Yes. Huh. Yes, that is at max right now. <laughs> yes. Okay, with that, we'll go into committee reports. Dave, you want to start us out today? Sure. Um, on March 8th, last Wednesday, I had a meeting with Kimberly Savageau and the recorder, uh, referenced her office and uh, the activities that uh, she is going to come before us in her annual report, I believe, next week. And uh, just a few topics that she she wanted to talk about and that was followed up by a compliance fund meeting and we are in full compliance and as usual uh, Kimberly has kept us in line with state expectations that will all be presented by her I think in a week or two weeks um, on Thursday the next day on the 9th attended the beyond the yellow ribbon meeting um, We didn't get an agenda that week, so I'm going to have to do this by memory. I know there were conversations about the PACT Act and the 9-11 bonuses, and as Kirk Cannon indicated, anybody who feels like they may be uh, eligible for those should get a hold of Kurt. That, that uh, the bonus is going to be in place. Or I know they've extended some of it out uh, for further applications. Uh, later that day i attended the red river regional dispatch center board of authority meeting covered a couple of different topics there um we did have a presentation uh, regarding the uh, estimates on on the uh, cost of the facilities being built. It has come in high. Uh, Eric Johnson and uh, Mary Phillippe both addressed that. Uh, as it looks, uh, the city of, Moore, or city of Fargo and West Fargo 
are going to be in consultation with Cass County in regards to the offset uh, for the uh, overage that uh, it came in. Uh, Moorhead and Clay County are locked in at a set amount, which is 1.5 for Clay County and 1 million for uh, the city of Moorhead. So that doesn't directly impact us. Uh, we looked at the facility lease, and again, that was addressed by Mary Phillippe and Eric Johnson. And we had a discussion on the backup site, and that uh, is a work in progress. At this point, at least in the short term, they could keep the current location of the dispatch center. Uh, up and running as a backup, but long term, that really is not a uh, something that we want to do, given the value of the property and the uh, lack of desirability for that location as a dispatch center. So there's going to have to be kind of an ongoing uh, effort to identify what the best option is on a backup site. And then yesterday. Uh, Commissioner Krabenoff and I met with Joe Rasso uh, with the uh, Greater Fargo-Moorhead EDC. Part of that conversation, or the majority of that conversation, was looking at uh, pending legislation. If it didn't pass yesterday, it's probably going to pass because it's come out of committee and has gone uh, with the unanimous vote in the North Dakota le State Legislature allowing um, a uh, job development authority to be established within municipalities or counties in North Dakota and allowing them to uh, pass up to four mills uh, in uh, property taxes. And we're looking at that, Cass County's indicated a strong desire to do that. The composition of the board of directors of, of that JDA would be members of the EDC. And there's been a uh, recognition that Minnesota has members on the uh, far, Greater Fargo-Moorhead EDC and would be included in that if we can come up with a joint powers agreement. And we had a general discussion on that, the pluses and minuses, and again, that's just a heads up. It's something we're gonna have to work on over time as, as this develops. And that completes my report. Okay. Paul? Um, yeah. Good to be back after being away for a week. Um, I did wanna go back to a, a meeting I had on March 2nd. Um, I don't think there was any reporting on it. So I went to, uh, uh, I was part of, got my orientation and was part of the Clay County Collaborative. And then we had a meeting that uh, followed that. And that, that collaborative um, is in a, a position right now where they're working with uh, two people uh, keep uh, coordinating the whole program. And those two have been on staff for many, many years, and and they're needing a, re, a replacement. So anyway, the majority of that meeting was, in fact, um, coming up with the uh, the guidelines and the uh, description for a new um, new coordinator, and it was approved to uh, have a salary uh, around roughly thirty thousand dollars, so uh, increase about six thousand from what these others we're doing. That salary is paid by 10% uh, of the state grants that come in through uh, LCTS, uh, which is local collaborative time study. And, um, and, right, and so if that holds as it has been, uh, that should cover that salary amount. If it doesn't, uh, if it's a little short, uh, the other thing, uh, discussion was we go back to looking at fees for that program. Right now, current fees are $100, and I think the county's at 250 and my understanding was four positions. So um, 
will remain, uh, we'll see what remains. Uh, the idea of the fee, uh, potential fee increase uh, was going to go on to the, this is a governance committee, or board, I should say, and it was going to go on to the uh, policy board uh, to have a greater discussion about any type of fee change. But anyway, just know that that's moving forward and um, uh, it's uh, the work being done as coordinators, again, being done by two people that have been uh, doing it for a long time. So um, they're excited about the amount of uh, uh, attention going toward this uh, collaboration and, and the fund requests and the county does quite well statewide. So just run a report on that. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Ebiger mentioned the EDC meeting we had yesterday. Uh, I thought uh, the potential what they were talking about um, uh, my first uh, conversation about it, I thought it had uh, certainly has value and, and the momentum certainly that North Dakota carries uh, in the workforce development area for our whole area uh, will certainly, um, you know, has an effect on Clay County too. So we'll just see where that uh, goes. Uh, certainly uh, my view at this point uh, looks favorable. Um, Last night I went to the Buffalo Red uh, Watershed District, um, uh, their uh, monthly meeting. Uh, just a few things to report. Uh, continuing work is going on, not work, excuse me, study, and, uh, and, and cleanup work on our Project 80, the Stony Creek. And, and then um, uh, uh, Eric uh, with Houston continues to look and sees some pathways uh, coming ahead, you know, for pot pot potentially, excuse me, uh, $2 million, uh, which I don't know if that means this year or next year, uh, but that may help with possible retention in that area uh, on lands that aren't cur currently ag. They're right on the east side of the interstate, and uh, we'll see how that develops. Um, they approved... Uh, going back to our March, no, the meeting before March, maybe it was February 28th meeting. Uh, if you all remember, we uh, made that half payment for the, uh, the FEMA study uh, to Houston, and that we, we approved, you know, paying half of that, roughly $17,500 of, of that, um, that overage um, to Houston, and the uh, Buffalo Red approved the other half last night, so that's done. Um, then also, um, uh, we gave Jerry Van Amberg as part of that um, uh, Morehead Clay County group, JPA, uh, for the money that uh, we uh, told the group that we were going for um, money or bonding, you know, the $36 million that on, on the county share. So that was brought out that we had given that on to Representative Joy. I apologize, I can't remember. Who's the Senate uh, uh, author on that, you know? Um, the name, he's from, he represents a small part. At this point, it's, um, Mark huh? Are you talking about Mark Johnson or? Did Mark? Did yes. He? Oh, did Mark? Oh, okay. I'm not sure that he has yet, but I think there, there was some discussion. That's what they were leading toward. Okay, but uh, Representative Joy definitely, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, I wanted to um, be correct on that. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, so. oh, and then they had an advisory committee on, I believe it was Friday, um, Commissioner Mojo nor I were able to be there, but getting feedback from it and just letting you know this advisory committee, which was about 10 people or 12 people this year, uh, they just had a nice discussion about the work that the Buffalo Red's doing and gave positive <coughs> And that's my report. I have no report, but I, I, I do want to mention um, I re we had some written testimony last week regarding the YES program that was going to be before the um, Lakes Country Service Cooperative. They did hold their meeting last week, and I, uh, I was out of town. I did not attend. Uh, I did receive an email from the executive director that they did vote to close. 
that YES program, I believe it's effective Gen or July 1st. And I know there's a, you know, there's a lot of, the, it's been a good program over many years. And I think there, uh, there's been so many new things in the, that have developed new ways for alternative learning that have become available uh, by each district. So the YES program basically served the school districts of Clay County. And, um, and as I mentioned, I think DGF is starting their own alternative programming next fall. And so, um, you know, there was certainly the board had some concerns, but uh, they ultimately voted to close the S program. So that's all okay. I have. All right, last week I attended um, well, the Beyond the Yellow Ribbon, which David Ridley reported on. Uh, um, Dave from Moorhead State, uh, excuse me, Minnesota State University of Moorhead, Moorhead reported that they are accept, putting an art exhibit on by veterans that they're going to display at the, at uh, Moorhead State. Uh, and Kurt uh, reported on uh, the vet court, uh, which they said the last graduate uh, graduated last Wednesday. I was going to attend that. I got there about a few minutes late, and they just. Miss uh, graduation, but I did stay for drug court, and um, they, I mean, they're busy in that drug court. I mean, they had 16 people that had to be, be report there that day, you know. So uh, that judge was kept pretty busy there, getting all those people in there, and um, looks like she had a pretty good group in there to, to keep track of. Um, so I guess those are my. Uh, those are the two meetings I had beyond the L Ribbon, and like I said, I attended the drug court, and that was a very interesting uh, presentation there. Okay. Uh, Derek, I think, yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, last Tuesday, March 7th, pretty much all day we had the social workers mediation. Uh, we met with the social workers business agent, stewards, um, Josh Hagem, our la labor attorney, and Anna, myself, and the uh, Bureau of Mediation Services mediator to discuss some outstanding issues with the social workers contract. Um, we did come to some ten tentative agreements. They're, the members are going to vote on that on March 21st, and then I'll bring that to the board on March 28th, probably in a closed session to begin with, and then we'll um, vote on that as well. Wednesday, March 8th, uh, we had a manager's meeting. Some of the topics we discussed, we just reviewed the, pro the procurement policy and the uh, proclamation and re resolution policy that I believe was uh, approved by you a couple, last week or a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about the management retreat on April 20th, um, went through some HR reminders. Uh, Steve gave an update on the building uh, building projects that are ongoing in the substance use facility in the DMV. Um, starting uh, looking at the budgeting process beginning next month in April. And Rory presented uh, a piece on doing more electronic signatures with DocuSign uh, versus Sign Now. I think the, the consensus was that the Sign Now was a better um, product than, than the DocuSign and, and cheaper as well. Um, also on Wednesday, I worked on some costing sheets as a result of the mediation on Tuesday. Um, also had a discussion with Nick at MCIT on the payroll audit and estimate reports coming up. Um, Thursday, March 9th, uh, I had highway interviews over at the maintenance shop and um, we did have a, a good candidate. An offer was made and accepted. That candidate has a CDL Class A already and is also a certified diesel mechanic. So I think we have a, good, a very good applicant there. Um, also on Thursday, I met with Jackie to talk about uh, how HR and her position as the communication coordinator can assist us. She's also setting up um, meetings with other department heads to, to go over that. So I think that's an ongoing thing. Um, and also on Thursday, I continue to work on an ongoing personnel issue. On Friday, March 10th, I spent most of the day creating some preliminary reports for the 2024 budget um, and then had a meeting with Steve on some upcoming items uh, while, to watch while he was gone. 
Um, yesterday, Monday, March 13th, I sat in on the AMC update that they had via Zoom. Um, discussed some personnel issues with one of the department heads. Continued work on the preliminary 2024 budget reports and had a discussion with Justin to reference a accident that happened on Sunday with one of our uh, snow plows and some of the processes that we have to do when that happens. So um, that is concludes my report. Okay, just to remind everybody, next, next Monday, um, we got the Township Officers Meeting. Correct. And that's going to be held out at the Solid Waste, the Resource Center. So a little yep. change of venue there, so just a reminder that's going to be going on starting at, I suppose, 8.30, yeah. Okay. Brian, did you have anything? No. Okay. No further instructions, Jackie? No. You sure? Okay. Very good. Anybody else? We're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>